All right, so we have an example um, for disc brakes from class 16. Now, I don't think I'm going to um, assign any problems with uh, disc brakes. So this is a recording that maybe I'll use in um, other classes. Uh, I just tried to try to make this a practical problem. So I picked a Honda Pilot. Um, I own a Honda Pilot. I like them. And I was traveling 65 miles per hour. Um, I rarely go that slow. And it needs uh, to stop in 300 feet. I figure football field. That's an interesting thing. Let's set this up. So I invented this problem. And um, I did go outside and measure my tires when I wrote this. It was third, they were 30 inches. And uh, I looked up on the internet somewhere and 0.35 was a coefficient of friction. Um, or maybe I'd look that up. Actually, I think that is actually in the table um, in the book. So I want to find the actuating force that's required uh, for both uniform pressure and uniform wear. So first, 65 miles per hour. Um, that would be... Uh, 5,280 uh, feet per miles divided by 3,600 seconds per hour, and we get 95.33 feet per second. Then um, we would figure out the number of wheel rotations. Do I need that? Yes, I will in a minute. Okay, so for that number, um, the number of wheel rotations that would take delta theta would be the delta distance divided by uh, the radius of the tires, right? So if you want to figure out the circumference and so forth and uh, uh, that type of thing and uh, you work it out, you would see that that happens to be true. It says 300 feet and that's 30 inches divided by 12 divided by 2 and so that becomes 240 radians is uh, I say number of did I say number of turns I'm at the number of radians that have to uh, occur here now we get the kinetic energy that's going to be in the car that needs to end up getting dissipated and so that's going to be uh, equal to one half mass times velocity squared. I'm going to ignore all the rotational uh, kinetic energy. But if we had some problem where it was mostly rotational energy, that's probably what we would use. But the uh, uh, con translational kinetic energy is much larger. I'm going to use slugs here. So that's 4,300 divided by 32.2 because we're in feet. That's going to work out. And we get 95.33 um, squared or 606,800, these are foot pounds. Um, I don't bother turning them into any other kinds of units. And then to figure out what the torque is uh, necessary, um, if it was constant torque the entire time, and of course we, don't, we know that that might not be true, we might apply uh, the torque gradually or the braking system might put the torque on gradually. But if we uh, assume uh, we could figure out what the work energy that would be required there from theta 1 to theta 2, and that would be moment d theta right here. Um, so just so we know that with torque times the uh, delta, if the torque was constant throughout the whole thing, um, and that would end up being equal to uh, the kinetic energy. So we could figure out that the torque has to be the kinetic energy divided by the uh, distance. Uh, the, the radians, so 606, 800 divided by our 240, and that's the torque that needs to be applied. Um, I don't know if I accidentally made this just one break. This would actually have to be the torque, I believe, that would need to be applied at each of the um, at the wheels. Now I'm just thinking of that just now. That's great. Um, Hmm, do I ever divide by four? I really, oh no, I do. Okay, I see. I divide by eight, all right, later on for number of pads, right, for number of surfaces. So uh, that's that's where I, I could do it any place. Now, um, how do I get this? I got the, oh, I have the dimensions here, 145 and 100. These are all millimeters. I actually get, looked up the brake uh, pad um diameter no i got some diameters here i actually got these diameters this is real 
and then um, figured out what uh, uh, like an arc. I think I picked 60 degrees or I might have looked up and like superimposed a brake pad on here. Like I've said, I've tried to make this a real problem. So um, the RO of the thing is going to be 145. I think I picked, yeah, 145, right? Yeah. 145 divided by 25.4 or 5.709 inches. And then um, RI was 100 uh, divided by 25.4. And that's probably going to be something close to four. Yeah, 3.937. Um, and I decided that the angle is going to be theta 1 is equal to 60 degrees. And theta 2 was going to be equal to 120 degrees. Okay. And so for one uniform wear, we have RE, I hate that stupid thing. I'd love to know what the hell that does. I'll pay you $100 if you figure out how to, how to make that thing stop. And it actually works, by the way. You can't just uh, give me an answer. You got to make sure that I got to prove that it works. 5.709. And I don't think I'm allowed to pay uh, students money, so um, that was a theoretical, rhetorical um, suggestion. 4.823 inches is the average, um, and if we want the position that we would have for this, we would take the cosine of theta 1 minus the cosine of theta 2. Um, theta 2 minus theta 1, remember that that's got to be uh, in radians right there, times RE, and uh, you could plug these numbers in right here. So that, that's what's going to be onto the thing. And we end up, uh, we find that it's uh, 4.606 inches right there. And so the force that would be required, right, so the F... Um, is going to be equal to torque divided by coefficient of friction Re times N, right? Which is going to be the number of surfaces. Okay, and by the way, this is these are inches. We've got to be careful of that because we have um, foot pounds up here. So um, what we end up finding is that's going to be 2528. Um, I'll make these into inch pounds so that multiply that by 12, uh, divide by coefficient of friction and uh, 4.823 is the um, RE. You know, I don't know why we're finding that R bar. Maybe I said um, I wanted to find that. Um, they said to find the active actuation force. So I didn't actually need to get R bar. Interesting to me. I thought for a second that I had to get it. So I guess I just got it for the heck of it. Oh, and by the way, N was going to be number of surfaces was eight. All right. So there's um, where there, there's a pad on each side of these uh, of, of the discs, right? And um, and there's going to be four wheels. Um, so we're going to say this going to be e evenly. So it's going to be. Uh, 2,247 pounds, right? Now, if I were instead now um, to go and use uh, uniform wear, no, uniform pressure, I would find uh, that RE is going to be two-thirds RO cubed minus RI cubed divided by R O squared minus R, wow, that thing's really hating my life, R I squared. Um, and two thirds, we don't need to put numbers in here. I don't know why I'm doing it, honestly. But, you know, it's just a thing. Oh, cubed, baby. Divided by our um, 5.709 squared minus 3.937 squared and we end up with 4.877 remember uh, inches remember for the other one 
uh, we, we got uh, 4.823, which is not a whole lot different. So we don't expect a big different result, but we continue through and we find that the force for uniform pressure is going to be 2,528, once again, times 12, divided by our coefficient of friction and 4.8778. Um, and we end up getting 2,222 pounds, um, as opposed to um, as opposed to uh, the previous answer of 2,247. So there's not a whole lot of difference, and that's kind of uh, understandable considering um, what we learned here when we looked at uh, this graph right here. You can see that. Um, they got closer and closer to each other, that uh, uh, non-dimensional uh, torque that we had up here um, onto the thing, right? So this was the equation that related torque to that. Um, now, I don't know. I think I'll continue with this problem. Let me see. Do I have... Did I use the same problem for temperature? Let me see for my example. Oh, yeah, I do. Okay. So I say... And this is a, um, a demonstration of maybe what not to do. Um, so right here, I go ahead and I um, keep all that nonsense. I use the, yeah, here we go. I need to make some room for my calculations. I didn't have it in my slides. Uh, there you go. So, I say, for the braking Honda Pilot, estimate the brake temperature rise and the maximum temperature. Each brake disc weighs 30 pounds and has a surface area of 300 square inches, and the air temperature is 70 degrees. And if you recall, the kinetic energy uh, was 606,800 foot-pounds. And so, for each disc... that needs to be able to um, uh, handle that divided by four. So 151,700 foot pounds, All right? So we're gonna try to use that. And we say that the uh, amount of heat is gonna equal to the kinetic energy uh, that needs to be dissipated or 151,700 foot pounds. I should have just written that thing out. Oh, that was foot pounds, yeah. Yeah, would have saved me some time here. Foot pounds um, divided by our 778 foot pounds per BTU, and that's going to be 195 British thermal units. Um, the delta T, the big delta T that we would get, we would say it would be that H divided by CP divided by M. Right now, the, the okay. So this is kind of irritating uh, the units uh, as part of this, but um, I'm using point one two here, and I'm not so sure. Um, so W is used in the textbook. Let me go through here and. Um, Let me go. Let, let me let me go, get out of here. I'm gonna keep this right here, and let me take a look at the book right here. I'm really curious to see uh, what happens when we get over to um, that section right here on the temperature on the properties right here. So um, I'm saying, uh, let's see the properties um, as they're putting it onto here. Um, and they're using, yeah, they're using U.S. units. And um, they say, okay, so this is what, here you go. Here's the clue here that they're messing around with this pound's mass. Because I know the density of steel is 
four usually uh, pounds, just regular pounds, like pounds that weigh something per cubic inch, right? So they're taking in, they're saying these are pounds mass. Um, I've always disliked that uh, whole uh, conversion thing onto there. So yeah, right here is where we're doing that same thing. And we're um, fr from uh, Shigley right here. We, we are uh, using that same uh, approach uh, to the thing. So, um, but here I'm actually using uh, real values as far as I'm concerned. Um, let's go back into this right here. And uh, so uh, I say 195 uh, divided by our 0.12 for steel and 30 pounds and I looked this up by the way that was close to what the break that what these uh, um, weighed uh, I think that's true um, I try to figure out the time to break right so the time to break and we have V squared is equal to uh, V zero squared plus 2a delta x which is constant acceleration or constant deceleration in this case that's another assumption we have to make so we say 0 is equal to 95.33 squared is the uh, um, speed is the initial speed right we turn that and then uh, 2 2 times the acceleration times 300 feet and we get an acceleration as we should have negative 15.15 so that's like um, uh, uh, not quite but nearly half a G right so that's nearly 32.2 being the um, thing so I say that it's 0.47 G's interesting uh, amount of breaking in that time um, but now if I want to get the amount of time uh, that it takes here I take the velocity is equal to the original velocity uh, plus that right here and I can solve for uh, my time is just going to be uh, V minus V O divided by a is that true yep and so that's going to be 0 minus uh, uh, 95.33 divided by minus 15.15 and I end up with 6.294 seconds that's actually that's a pretty long time, right? 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. So that's not really breaking very fast, right? So it's going to be breaking 6 seconds and 300 feet. Interesting, though. Um, I just picked that 300 feet uh, arbitrarily. Um, so like, so the average speed that we would be going, by the way, uh, so we need to uh, now use um, these figures right here. So that average uh, speed... That average speed that we would have is somewhere along the lines of, oh, it's pretty high up there, right? Because we were, oh, no, no, the average speed. I, I should have written that down. So the average speed is obviously going to be 95.33 divided by 2, or 47.67 feet per second. And that's the units we have right here. So it's somewhere in between there. You know, like it's, oh, oh no, don't do that. Oh, come on. Why did I accidentally get into that mode? I'll get maybe into here. So you're going to turn it into a... No, we got it. Okay. Uh, so somewhere in there, right? Somewhere near, like just below 50 and right in here. And I estimate that my F is approximately 6.5. Um... And we know that uh, this temperature, let's say, um, I assumed that the average, that the temperature rise right here. Um, let's say, um, guess that that T minus T theta is equal to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know. It's like right in there. So that was like my, my first guess. Um, just to pick a number, right? Because it was easy enough. They look down there. I mean, I could have just picked 500 degrees. I don't. I don't know which to pick. So I take and I um, take uh, uh, that. That ends up being H R is approximately three e to the minus six. If you uh, look at this thing right there, you'll see 
then that's going to be whatever. Um, BTUs divided by seconds, inch squared, degree Fahrenheit. And then you have an HC, which is approximately 2e to the minus 6. I probably picked it because it was like right there crossing the line. I probably picked this one first. That's the HC. That's the convective uh, heat transfer coefficient. And here's the radiant heat transfer coefficient. And so that's where we get those numbers. Um, so with that, I'm able to get an HCR, which for some reason I have a cross in there. I got an HR plus FV. Uh, um, HC. I think I forgot to put the V on that H before, but 3E to minus 6 plus 6.5 times 2E minus 6. I get 1.6E to minus 5, um, and these are BTUs per second inch squared degree Fahrenheit. Um, and then I, from that, I get a beta, which I go HCR times A divided by M C P, right? So 1.6 E minus 5, 300 square feet, uh, 30, and 0 0.12, and that equals 1.333 E to the minus 3 is beta. Now they say that the T max, all right, is going to be equal to T theta plus delta T divided by 1 minus E to the negative beta times time. So that's going to be 70 plus 54.16 and we get 1 minus E to the minus 1.33 e minus 3 uh, times 6.294. And what we find out, T max was equal to 6,551 degrees Fahrenheit. We obviously did a really bad choice of making that 200 degrees. So let's say instead we go, um, what if we use the maximum? Okay, so um, I suspect here's where I made my mistake. So let's instead, if we've made a mistake here, we want to go revisit it. Let's use the maximum one right here. Maybe because uh, we see that we had a higher temperature. We only got, went up to 700. So let's see what they do. If we go ahead and use those values, I don't need to go here. It says if max H R and H C this only turns to be 3958 degrees uh, Fahrenheit that's still a whole lot right and that's not a period that's a comma that's that's a very high temperature right there maybe that's true I don't know maybe that's just very localized temperature but um, I think some of the issues are the heat transfer and all these assumptions uh, that, that get uh, made into the thing. Um, if we were to do, go into use another resource to try to find uh, these values, um, for instance, uh, we will um, keep it for now because I have to delete a bunch of other stuff. Let's say that we go to um, some resources that you have available to you that I've supplied um, on our Blackboard site. If it'll go, come on. Um, so we have useful links and resources somewhere here. Useful links and resources and uh, down here, so you pass the technical writing, we have breaks somewhere in here. Where you go? Where'd you go? Do I? You mean I don't have breaks in here? Come on. Am I losing it? I don't see them. Small engines. I need to add breaks. Interestingly enough. Okay, so um, journal bearings, design, material selection, buckling mechanisms. It just seems to me that I should be seeing these. 
breaks somewhere. Books. Uh, maybe they're in the books section. Um, so anyway, uh, so we have various things right here. Okay, so breaks. Let's take a look at um, this uh, uh, from, from this uh, publisher right here. So he has breaks, clutches, and so forth. Um, and let's see, do they have disc breaks as part of this? You'll see that they very, a lot of things will be very, uh, these are like couplings, I think. Yeah. You can see these resources. I, I honestly, I think you should download these uh, for your own e uh, edification or for your own future use. I've provided a lot of information that I've accumulated from various places. These clutches. Uh, you can see that, by the way, those are cone clutches. You know, we didn't do anything with those. Here's some disc clutches. Um, some just these are just some equations um, that you could try to use. And by the way, you want to be careful not just to go equation shopping with this. When you use this type of resource, do the type of practice that we've been doing in class. Be that kind of engineer that doesn't just go hunting for an equation. Now go ahead and try to use the equation and see what happens with it. But that remember that's not the final answer, right? And make sure that you're using it appropriately. Which one that you're going to pick, right? So there's energy equations for brakes. Um, hoisting and lowering a load, um, various brake formulas, band brake formulae uh, that you might have, and and some of these might be different from uh, ones that you would use in um, ones that you might have in um, in Shigley, right? Doesn't mean that these are wrong, uh, or or that sh or that Shigley is wrong. It's just uh, uh, that the, these are an assembly, and be careful like with some of these, like the the. These are really just us, them um, using, um, I can't use this to write on this, can I? It'd be nice if I could, but I can't. Um, I swear, let's see, hey, what happened with my uh, power? There was like only 44%. That used it that quickly, huh? Um, so anyway, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, these are some equations, but, but be careful using those equations. The, the, all these equations are, are just doing the free body diagram and then rearranging the equation that you, that you had, the basic equation between the tensions. So there's nothing magical about those, and don't be the kind of engineer that can't do a free body diagram. That's just pathetic. Um, so anyway, uh, I don't see any stuff in here, um, and we're getting near the end of the chapter. Uh, on uh, band uh, on disc breaks, but uh, so we could go to another resource and we could see if they have any disc break stuff in here. Um, that was just one. You could see that we have breaks and clutches by Childs right here, and in their book, what they cover in breaks. And this one, I believe, no, it's well, this is, says springs. I might have the wrong one in here. Let's see, what did I say? I said uh, uh, brakes and clutches should be 10. Yeah, brakes and clutches. I think this one has a lot of examples in it. Is that the one? Oh, uh, yeah, every one of these things that's uh, uh, grayed out right here. These are all examples, but you could have um, brakes. Um, there's uh, That's an automotive clutch right here, and they're showing some things, and disc brakes, and here's some equations, and you should be, uh, they should be mildly familiar to you. Um, they don't, they have some kind of, something wrong with their uh, symbols. Look at that. Their parentheses got all screwed up in this, in their printing up of the thing. So, um, I don't think they do temperature here for their disc brakes, right? So that was me being um, a little bit uh, um, ambitious. They do have the external shoe brakes, and do they have internal shoe brakes, and that type of thing. This is just a really good resource uh, for engineering. Here you go, band brakes. Um, and yeah, there's the same equation that, uh, that we've been using. Of course, they probably, if you look in the... Um, this this whole book has uh, probably has references has Shigley uh, right in there. By the way, they have Juvenal. That's one guy that I use right there. Fundamentals of Machine Components. That's a guy. And uh, uh, Shigley. No, actually, um, what is the is it Budnes? Is it the the one they're going to have? They're going to use Budnes uh, right here. Bosch. Uh, <laughs> I think they're making a liar out of me. Um, certainly, Shigley's got to be in there somewhere. No, okay. Well, be that way.
They probably went to the source and they purposely uh, went around uh, not using Shigley. But anyway, this is a, a, another resource. And they didn't bother trying for temperature. And then the guy Mars. I actually think this might be the same one. Power transmission devices. Uh, I don't know. That might be... Um, they might have brakes as part of this right here. Power transmission division. Oh, those, that is probably gears. Yeah, this is all gears. Well, there's belts and chains. Yeah. So that one doesn't have it. And this is a really great video, but you're not going to get this far anyway. That's fine. Um, standard handbook uh, of machine uh, design. This is another version, um, th another thing written by Shigley and Mish. Um, so if you go to, uh, clutches and brakes in chapter eight right here we will see um let's see where we have do we have a, a table of contents no they just have like this right here It'd be nice um to see more things here but you'll get more there it goes into a little bit more depth into things um i don't think yeah, there's a there's a band break right here. So here's another band break. Um, here's some cone clutches. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's um there's a, a, some variations in there. But anyway, I figured you'd want to uh, explore some of that and see some of um the the variety of um. Okay. Wait. A variety of choices that you have I don't know if this is the that's chapter 5 for a thing and then design a machine actually I think there's one that I kind of liked does it have brakes in it no these are different gears um, and maybe some bearings in there shaft bearings planetary gears wave gears don't even know what that is uh, I mean it maybe I need to learn about it right uh, yeah, they don't have brakes in this one. Um, and then, let's see, I gave you a guide down below of um, brakes. So that's chapter 12 as part of this. And, oh, this is actually a pretty good one. I liked I liked this uh, uh, this author. Uh, even, uh, there's a lot of different, a lot of different, um, uh, examples and uh, this, uh, this can, I think these are pretty good insights actually into this one um, I think it's a good alternative it's also a McGraw Hill book by the way which is a Shigley is also McGraw Hill and do we do disc breaks so I, I, I haven't I, I think maybe uh, at some point in um, various other, uh, I don't know what, where I should start this, but trying to make sure that you see that the resources I've provided um, are, are, are alternative things, alternatives that you have when trying to look something up when you're trying to uh, apply some of these things. But you can see that this is, um, yeah, so here, here is like the equations that they're using here. And they might actually give the uh, der a derivation of the uniform uh that's uniform pressure for that um, equivalent radius or, or the friction radius right there. And they, they, they go through an example. Will they do temperature? That's what I want to know. Um, nope. And then he gets uh, right here. By the way, this is always, uh, uh, always intrigued me whether I should ask these as multiple choice questions or short answer questions on exams. I've been... Um, uh, I've, I, I've been, I've thought about it before. Oh, look, uh, here's an example. A flywheel has a mass right here, assuming that they went to heat generated. Okay, yeah. So, um, I think I've uh, done enough damage for uh, one example and written a long enough uh, ex uh, uh, video. So, but maybe it'll be useful at some other time. So, that's all I have. And it was 33 minutes.